Let us open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. Today's study of God's Word is taken from chapter 28 of Matthew, verses 1 to 15. Matthew 28, verses 1 to 15. We started studying this passage last Lord's Day, where we saw Mary Magdalene, according to verse 1, and other Mary, which is the mother of James and Joseph, uh, coming to Jesus' grave on the third day of his death and burial to put spices on his body. The Jewish people did not embalm their bodies as the Egyptians would do. Uh, they would only sprinkle spices on the body and, and wrap it with fine linen. And sometimes, in this case, it appears that they wanted to enter the grave thinking that Jesus would be still in that grave and then put upon his body, which is already wrapped, some of the spices they brought along. However, as we learned last week, there was a huge earthquake. They were concerned about uh, the entrance into the grave as it was a tomb with a huge stone uh, at the mouth of the tomb and was guarded by the Roman soldiers so that nobody would enter or touch the body and it had the Roman seal on it. And so they were rather unsure of the access they can receive uh, to attend to the body of Christ. Nonetheless, by their sheer love and determination for Christ, uh, they have moved that way to the tomb. And when they reached there, they were expecting, uh, I don't know what, because it was almost an impossible situation. But against all odds, uh, they came. Maybe they were hoping somebody will help them to get in. But God himself had mercy on them. You see, in their coming, uh, the, though we may think of uh, great love and and uh, uh, dedication to Christ, we also see the immaturity of their faith. Actually, Jesus already said on the third day he will rise up. So why would they bring the spices as though Jesus is going to remain in the grave for long? It is uh, something that uh, constantly troubled me whenever I read it. What is the a real motivation. Uh, is it true faith or no faith? You see, sometimes people can be moved ignorantly to do things that looks good, but still lacking what is really needed. Uh, I'm not just talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about believers like you and me, just like Mary Magdalene and other Mary. And in fact, as I showed you last week, it was not just Mother Mary, sorry, M Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, but also there were uh, other uh, women also in this group. Uh, we saw that from the Gospel of John. Uh, and so um, here we see that uh, they, they came together with some form of love for Christ and at... Uh, Imperfect love, I would say, which lacked the purity of faith, the precision of faith. Uh, but God is ever merciful to us. If one of the reasons why we are here today to worship God is, not, is because of God's love uh, that surpasses our weaknesses. Uh, yes, we have faith, we all agree. Uh, but of course, whether that faith is honorable faith or we have honorably exercised our faith or not, only God knows because uh, we sometimes justify our weaknesses, our shortcomings, our sins uh, by coming to church. Oh, I'm going to church, so I should be okay. Uh, and yet we don't want to confess our sins, yet we don't want to ac accept our uh, unbelieving, uh, doubtful, fearful spirit by which we live. In fact, uh, sometimes if you think very carefully about things that you and I do uh, in the name of Christ, you find yourself laughing at yourself. 
how did I dare to do this? How did I think that this is the right thing to do? The reason is because we, we, we do not ex exercise our mind uh, to apply God's word fully in our life. We don't check our motives, we don't check our imaginations, we don't check our uh, decision to do something for God or something for Christians or something for the church according to God's word. And we just think that these things are done for Christ or Christ's people or church, then it should be okay. It may not be okay. Actually, it was such a uh, difficult thing to conceive that this was very pleasing to Christ that they came with spices to put on his body. When he so clearly insisted time after time that on the third day he will rise again. But again, praise God for his compassion toward us all. He doesn't love us because we are perfect people. He reaches out to us in our times of weaknesses and uh, silliness and stupidity and come and minister in the fullness of his wisdom, power, love and grace and lifts us up. The events, in, uh, events that occurred on the third day of his burial was truly amazing. First of all, everything was set in its place by the resurrection of Christ. You see, if you were to think about all these events that happened on that day without thinking about the resurrection of Christ, all may look fantastic to you. You may not see the weaknesses of his followers. But when you put every apostle and every uh, lady who followed Christ against the perfection and the glory of his resurrection, you start to see, oh boy, if Jesus is not risen, all these people would have taken Christianity to some other end. Thank God Jesus is risen. Thank God he is alive. Thank God he intercedes for us on the right hand side of the Father today. Thank God he promises regularly through the scriptures and through the work of the Holy Spirit to our, our mean hearts, weak hearts, ignorant minds, straying minds, that he will never let us go. Oh, what a great, great and faithful Lord he is. As we sometimes sing, great is thy faithfulness. Come with me. After the angel told them in verse 5 of Matthew 28, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. That's exactly the situation. They are not seeking Jesus who will be risen on the third day. They came to look for Jesus who was crucified. Yes, it's true he was crucified. But this is the third day. He should be look, they should be looking for the risen Christ. But they were still looking for the crucified Christ. And the angel then said, He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Brethren, this was the grand declaration of Christian faith. Jesus is risen. How wonderful it is for us to know and believe that Jesus is risen. 
How wonderful it is for us to hear that great declaration again and again. That Jesus is risen. We are not serving a God who is dead and buried forever. We are not serving idols that cannot speak or talk or give counsel. We serve a living God. Even the Lord Jesus Christ and the angel made that declaration for us to remember it every Lord's Day, the first day of the week, which we have been given by God's word to be the day of worship because it's the day of resurrection of Christ, the first day of the week. And we, we by our worship, together with the angel, to the rest of the world and to ourselves, declare, he is not in the grave. He is risen on the third day. That's why you and I are here on the first day of the week. On Sunday, as we call it. And there, the statement is, he is not in the grave. He is risen. In fact, uh, the Greek word, verb used uh, here to translate is risen is aoris passive and that would mean that you can translate in this way he has been risen it's not that he's uh, he just came out but he has been risen he has been in that state of risen as he said as he said on the third day it doesn't mean that he was risen the previous day, but he, is, he has been risen just as he said on the third day. And we know that great truth that Scripture says that Jesus' resurrection was not just by himself. Yes, he said, I have the power to lay down my life. And I also have the power to take it back. However, the scripture clearly teaches us that uh, Jesus, I mean, the, uh, that Jesus' resurrection was also an act of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And this we cannot forget. Uh, this we must remember that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was an act of the triune God in their unity. The Father who has given us His Son was pleased that Jesus gave his, Himself as a perfect sacrifice for the redemption of His people. And God responded it, to it with much, much joy and pleasure and for the honor of Christ by, re by being part of his resurrection. And this is the truth that we must not forget. Please take a look at a few passages I'm going to refer to. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. Where we talk about spiritual baptism wherein Apostle Paul reminded the Roman Christians, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should not walk in newness of life. Well, in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, Romans 8, 11, Apostle Paul says about Jesus' res resurrection in this way, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So here Apostle Paul clearly says that the Holy Spirit raised up Jesus. So, why do you think about Jesus' resurrection? Was it an act of Christ himself? Was it an act of the Father alone? Or was it an act of the Spirit alone? No. All the three were involved 
in the resurrection of Christ. It was a mighty work of God that Jesus came out of the grave just as it has been predicted. And the, the angel very gently reminded the ladies about this fact that you are seeking Jesus who was crucified, but listen, he is not here. He is risen, as he said. And then he went on to say, come, see the place where he was lying. I believe at this point, the women went in, went into the tomb to see whether what the angel said is true or not. And of course, it was empty. So the message seemed to be very clear that the ladies must go from here, maybe with the spices they brought. The spice is of no use. You may, be brought, you may, you may have brought the spice with much love and, and uh, feelings for Christ, but now remember, he doesn't need your spice. He's risen. He's alive! You know, there is a thing about our service to God. When it is not of faith, it is a sin. Every act performed, even though you call it a service, when it comes from a heart that is not of faith, it is a sin. You must always remember in order to make sure our service is according to faith, it has to be according to the scriptures. You can't create your own service. It will be unacceptable to God. You remember when Abel and Cain came to worship God. They came to worship the same God. Cain didn't worship a false God. They came to the same God the true living God. But Cain offered a sacrifice without faith, according to Hebrews 11. But Abel offered an offering according to the faith, which is, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Pointing to Christ. He sacrificed a lamb. Abel sacrificed a lamb. That was pleasing to God. Adam gave a wonderful gift. Some Sunday school teacher, sorry, Sorry, not Adam, Cain. Some Sunday school teachers say, Oh, Cain, you know why Cain's serv service was rejected? Because he brought rotten fruit to God. It's not in the Bible. Don't tell that lie to your children, okay? Sunday school teachers and grandmas and grandpas, don't tell wrong stories to children. It's not because Cain brought rotten fruits. It's never said in the Bible it was so. I think he brought the best fruit, but still unacceptable to God because it was not according to the faith. So we must be very careful. Let's don't make Christianity an innovative religion of our mind. God is not short of ideas. I cannot be a pastor because I am clever, I'm charismatic, I'm smart, I got excellent idea. I was telling this morning in the Bible study time of a bishop's ordination that I watched yesterday. It bothers me the whole night and it still bothers me. And a thing that I repeatedly heard from different church leaders who were giving congratulatory remarks at the end of the consecration service is that we are living in a time the society has changed. May God help you, Bishop, to lead this church according to the changing circumstances of the society that we may remain relevant to the society. 
God forbid. God forbid that we will be so concerned about being relevant to the society. God is always relevant, but the thing is the society doesn't want a God who will ask the society to yield to him. And it is not the duty of the leaders of the church ever to lead the church to become more appreciative, more pleasing to the world. That is demonic. Our duty is to call the entire world to repentance and to serve God in righteousness and truth. We can't worship God anyhow, but must worship in spirit and in truth. You know, there are brethren who come from certain churches in here and say, oh, I like my church because it's exciting. We got mm, a lot of exciting thing going on. You are not exciting. I said, what do you want me to do to get it excited? Oh, more, more contemporary music. More drums. More fun. I always ask these guys, how many, ele Sorry. How many electrocuted guitars were there? You know what I mean, I'm joking. Okay. Uh, when, um, when Jesus was going around preaching, how many of the apostles were? Ching, ching. I'm sorry to, to mimic a bit. How many apostles had a singing band when he's praying the music goes? Oh Lord. Well, then everybody feel it in the air. These are all psychological, hypnotic, Manipulation of the minds of the congregation. Jesus and the apostles preached the gospel and the word of God simply, clearly, authoritatively. No mimics. Brethren, we've got to be extremely careful. Though we love Jesus and the stories about Jesus and the fact that he died for our sins does not mean our faith has taken him fully at his word. We cannot be partial followers of Christ. And even, I, I want to repeat that, even genuine believers like you and me sometimes fall short of services that, full of, that, that are full of faith. And we must be rebuked and corrected. And today I pray that the Lord will graciously rebuke us all and to see where we are going wrong. God has to open our mind. If God didn't send this angel to confront these ladies, I tell you, they will be standing there and crying when Jesus is not inside. If God didn't move that, that stone for them by the power of the angel that came down and the earthquake. What a sad day it would have been for these ladies. A hopeless Christianity. A hopeless bunch of followers of Christ. What a tragedy. What a contradiction of the true reality of Christianity. Praise God for this declaration. He is risen, as he said. Because we are going to see there are many interpretations to the fact that Jesus is risen. The Jewish leaders want it to be interpreted in a different way. We're going to see it later. And they would do every bit of mental manipulation and maneuvering to make sure that the world will not think that Jesus was risen as he said. But things happen according to their clever interpretations. God forbid that we ever try to add an iota to the truth of God's word. 
God forbid that we ever be leaders of God's people by pleasing the world and the crowd. And God grant us faith, unwavering faith, confident faith in the face of all impossible and hostile circumstances. May God be gracious to us. May he add strength to our faith. May he add enlightenment and knowledge to our faith that we may stand strong for the Lord. You know, brethren, I must say this again. That number of years that we spend as Christians or as pastors or elders or preachers will not guarantee that we will not make a mistake today. These were lovers of Christ. These were men who attended to Jesus. These were people who stood by the cross. Remember these ladies were there when Nathaniel and Joseph of Arimathea took down his body from the cross and laid it at the grave. They were brave women of love and consecration and that they got wrong and they got it wrong so please don't say with tears you know you i don't know why pastor you say i'm wrong i truly love the lord yes nobody is questioning your love for god but if you're wrong you're wrong I feel like saying sometimes we are very sincere, but very sincerely wrong. Having said that, let's now move to verse 7 and see how the, how the angel directed them and said, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there sh he shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Now, I want to try and help you to see some struggles we might appear, we might appear to have at this point. Now, uh, that's, that will only happen if you try to uh, put different gospel records of the events of the Resurrection Day side by side. Uh, now, come with me to John's Gospel, chapter 20. I did say last week that I will explain this today, so let me take time to explain that. Chapter 20 of John's Gospel. There are many opinions, but I'm going to share with you what I think would have happened. Um, verse 1, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early. Of course, Matthew says Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And we have other news that there were more than uh, two of them. But moving on. When it was at dark unto the sepulchre, and see at the stone taken away from the sepulchre, and she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. Now it's quite confusing, isn't it? In Matthew 28, we heard that she was with the other Mary and then when, uh, and then the angel uh, told, invited them to go into uh, the grave and see the place where Jesus was laid. And then immediately we read in verse 7 of Matthew 28 that the, the, the angel said, go quickly and tell his disciples. But it seems that something else happened at this time. When the rest of the ladies were listening to the angel, Mary Magdalene slowly left that place, it seems. She went alone away. She didn't go into the tomb to see whether Jesus was there. She ran immediately. Where did she go? According to verse 2, she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that was John, I believe, whom Jesus loved, 
and saith unto them, unto Peter and John, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. But of course, she, if she was there to hear very attentively what the angel said, what would she say? Oh, the angel said, he is risen. But that's not what she said to Peter and John. She said to Peter and John, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. She had her own interpretation. You see the problem? Mary Magdalene, this wonderful lady who followed Jesus, is still not instructed fully about Jesus' instruction. Not because Jesus never said what would happen on the third day, but she is allowing her own feelings and thoughts to interpret the event. So where are the rest of the ladies? I think they are slowly moving out now when this happens. So we see what happened. Peter, therefore, verse 3, went forth and that the other disciple and came to the sepulcher. They ran both together. There was a raising. <laughs> you must see the two old people running. And other disciple did outrun Peter. Oh, John takes credit. He was a better runner. You know, like in our church, we have quite a bit of running preachers here. Yesterday, did you see them playing soccer? After the adult fellowship in Pasiris Park? Well, they are all little players. And they all can run a bit. I used to outrun them, but now they outrun me. <laughs> I'm getting old and fat. And they are getting lean and strong. Well, it happens. But here, it seems that these two apostles were quite healthy and they did run. Well, they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. So John was the first one to arrive. What did he do? He stooped down. According to verse 5 of John 20. And looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet when he not in. Then come and Simon Peter. So Simon arrived only after John had a scan of the tomb. Simon followed him and went into the sepulchre. And see at the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with linen clothes, but wrapped together in place by itself. They went in also, then went in also that other disciple who came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the, script, from the dead. So tell me, when verse 8 says in John 20 that he saw and believed, what did he believe? That Jesus is risen? No, no, because they were told by Mary Magdalene what? His body was taken away. And that's why verse 9 clarifies, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. <laughs> These apostles were men of faith, when they stood there with excitement, the religious fervor, and all that you would expect of the followers of Jesus, they were actually proving how feeble and imperfect their faith was because it was not built upon the word of God, but the feelings and opinions of men and women. The empty tomb, Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, all misled by their own feelings. How we should pray humbly, Lord have mercy, that we say nothing out of our own feelings and opinions. You know, brethren, I must impress upon you, I must. A lot of us take Christianity as a matter of our judgment 
and our opinions. And we said many God dishonoring, desecrating things in our homes and in churches, in Sunday school classes, and in our private conversations and so-called fellowship. And we have pulled down many a time the glory of Christ with our twisted thinking which is without faith or which is of faulty thinking. May God deliver us from such ignorant confidence. May God deliver us. Again I say, Christianity is not built upon the opinions of the apostles, but what God has revealed to them by his grace. When we say the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles, we are not saying the apostles got some intelligent idea of their own and they propagated some kind of principles they gathered together when they sat together and thought about Christ. No, God forbid. Again, that's not the truth. The truth is that God has revealed in his mercy and grace the truths concerning his son through the apostles and prophets which became the foundation. Christ being the cornerstone. Christ is the cornerstone. Without Christ, apostles are nothing. If that is true about them, how much more you and I need to humbly pray, Lord, renew our mind that it may never conform to anything other than the scriptures. Keep our minds wholly filled with the scriptures. Your zeal without knowledge is a great danger. Your passion about Christianity, your passion of the story of Christ does not authenticate everything you utter. If anything at all that the events that follow Jesus' resurrection tell us is to give glory to God by saying what he says and doing what he demands. We cannot allow our minds to be the judge of all things concerning our faith. God must guide us. The resurrected Lord by grace must send his guidance, his light into our hearts, lest we may falter. You know, somebody said, Pastor Koshi, you even dare to criticize Peter and Paul. No, I don't. They are great men. But there are weaknesses that are obvious that comes up like this. And when I say it, it is not to demean them. They are honorable men. We thank God for the apostles and prophets. But they recorded this under the inspiration of God for us to learn for ourselves. is not to raise me above them. Who am I? I am infinitely worse than them. That's what I want to say. But these things we cannot forget. For they are recorded for our learning. Please don't think I'm being critical about them. No. I'm talking about our actual actual state of mind. This is the actual state of affair of every man who claimed to be a Christian, that on his own he cannot serve God, he cannot preach God's truth precisely. May the Lord give a very humble, docile, teachable, prayerful spirit to all of us you know brothers and sisters you who are teaching the children in the sunday school please don't take it lightly i hope none of you will become an instrument of imperfect faith and the teachings of imperfect faith in the classrooms of our junior worship and catechism class and so on And you must pray for me, please pray for me, that I will never teach you 
things that will not stand the test of the scripture. If I cannot be a teacher who will stand the test of the scrutiny of God's word, then I should stop preaching. Or if I have made a mistake, I should correct myself, repent from it, and seek the Lord for further help. Brethren, coming back to Matthew 28. And here, <clears throat> verse 7, once again, And go quickly, said the angel, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. So these ladies were told to go and tell the disciples, not just James, I'm sorry, not James, Peter, and John, but also to the rest, whoever they can meet, then ask them to go to Galilee. Because Jesus is not going to stick around in Jerusalem and Judea. He's going up north. And he will appear in Galilee as the risen Lord. So they have to meet him there. So verse 8. And they departed quickly. These women obeyed the angel and his words. They departed quickly from the sepulchre. Now, now that gives you the idea that they entered the sepulchre. And they're out of the sepulchre. They came out and they left. And they left, according to verse 8, with fear and great joy. <laughs> Wonderful, isn't it? Godly fear and joy. They might, they might have been very terrorized. At the same time, they have been so... So, so filled with God, God, God's awesome truth, the presence of the angel, and even more, the power of God's resurrection, so evidently portrayed before their eyes in that empty tomb with all the linen wrapped up and put aside. Oh, what a powerful impact. I don't even know whether they left the spies they brought, spices they brought of, to anoint Jesus. Whether they had with them, I don't know. It's not an issue here. There's something much more precious and glorious happened. And so, with great joy, with great joy, they left. They came troubled, but now they leave with great joy. <laughs> These ladies are also quite runners, quite, quite good runners, it seems. They're all running. <laughs> King's business need haste. Okay, when the Lord commands you, you don't stick around. You, go, you don't dilly-dally. When it comes to doing God's will, we must be quick. The ladies run. Well, the other day I was talking to some sisters who are older in our church doesn't mean they are very old but and they were talking about some of the difficulties sometimes they face when uh, some younger sisters come to help and uh, one of the things I heard from them I'm not going to tell everything I hear but just one thing which is relevant um, some of these sisters we give them a job to do they they forget or they are not there to do it or they never say anything about whether they are doing, whether they are completing, nothing. So when I heard this, it's a common situation because I not only heard from one or two, I heard from many different directions, from about many young ladies. I said, oh, that's not good. How come our young ladies are like that? Maybe they are distracted. So I was thinking, what is distracting them? Boyfriends? Pastor, don't be so rude. Yeah. Well, what is so busy about? Oh, 
When you say the Lord has got, brought me to this church, and you stand on the stage and say to all in the, in the face of the Lord's presence, I am here to serve the Lord, to lend my support at His will. And you say, okay, I will do. And then you dilly-dally and don't do your work. It's terrible. If, you, if you're supposed to fill a kettle of water and you don't do it, and you come at 11 o'clock to fill it, somebody else will do it because they can't wait for you. You should run to do God's work. Your heart and mind must be given to it. Right? So when the angel told these ladies, go tell the disciples, whoa, it's almost like they are placed above the apostles. Now God uses a group of holy women who were not perfect in the faith, but the Lord tenderly attended to them, ministered to their unbelief in this regard, strengthened them and said, now go testify to the apostles and tell them that I want them to go to Galilee. <coughs> you know, ladies, let me tell you, if you are hard, if with all their weakness, if it's given to obey God's word, he will tell you what is right. And when he tells you, do it, you're going to be a great help, not only to yourself, but also to the leaders of the church. And I want young sisters to know it. You're not a, some, you know, you're not in a church where ladies are looked down. No. This is a place we hope sisters will grow in the fullness of the Holy Spirit to be a great assistance to the Lord's work. And you are important. You are important not by virtue of who you are or what you can do, but the virtue of the fact that God has chosen you and loved you through Jesus Christ. And put his spirit and give you the word of God to admonish, to correct, to strengthen, to perfect. And then make you fit for the master's use. And you must be very happy to speed your way to serve the Lord. Let's read on. Verse 9. So it says at the end... Sorry, in verse 9 we see, As they went to tell his disciples, Behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet, and worshipped him. And then they said, then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Jesus was a very gracious. Grace upon grace is the fullness of God's grace and truth. Jesus knew these ladies who are now willing to serve me need more grace. How true this is. Huh? Some of you will sign up to serve the Lord in certain areas. And you meet with a problem. And then you know, oh, even though you're all ready to go, still you're not ready to go. Because there you feel like saying, I quit. Or feel like thrashing everybody around. And you are the only one who should live. <laughs> Life has so many struggles. Discouragement from within, discouragement from outside. Uh, inability to manage our own emotions and feelings. Everything go haywire. We feel like I enough. But thank God, if you are truly committed, the Lord will meet you in those moments of weakness. Even when you are so elated by the strength God has given to you, by the understanding of the word that he gives to you, and then you move, for, you move forward, the Lord has his way of meeting you. He knows you. Brethren, one thing that I have learned from scripture portions like this and from my experience is this. We are never equal to the task that God has given to us. No matter how small that work may look like. 
God has to be with us. Our risen Lord has to renew our, our hearts. We must walk in the newness of life by the resurrection power of the Lord, which we read from Romans 6 a while ago. No matter how happy we are, we can fail immediately unless the Lord sustains. You know, if a, if a young man and young woman in our midst, they are wonderful Christians and this is a wedding day. They are full of joy and everybody is rejoicing. Everybody is there for the, uh, the matrimony and everybody is ready. Pastor is ready. People are ready. Bridesmaids are ready. The musician is ready. The food is ready. Ready, 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 ready. In a split of a second, you can see that couple reducing to zero in front of everybody if something were to go wrong. You understand what I mean? When you are full of elation, as God guides you forward, you cannot for a second trust in yourself and forget your God. You must rely on the presence of God. These sisters are running, full of zeal, with great joy. The Lord intervenes and says, wait. And they had to be assured more. And God gives it so generously, so abundantly. Though let them have greater joy. This is a work they must do with more conviction. Because they are going to talk to the apostles. Apostles are not easy people to be persuaded, okay? <laughs> they are tough characters. So if these ladies were to go and say, oh, you know, this happened to Jesus. And also we know something else that happened from John 20. What is that? Mary Magdalene ran out and told Peter and, and uh, John. And they came and saw that Jesus was not there. And they already believed what? What did they believe? They believed that the body was taken away. So if these few ladies would go and say, oh, we got a slightly different opinion from Mary Magdalene that he was risen because so we saw an angel. They may say, you, you've gone crazy. Mary Magdalene was also there, but she has a different opinion. Why should we believe? Oh, yeah, but we know what? We met Jesus. We met the risen Jesus. He came to us. He talked to us. Oh, what did they do when they saw Jesus? They came and held him by the feet. They worshipped him. Held him by the feet. It doesn't mean they cling on to him, but they worshipped him. Fell at his feet. And worshipped him. And Jesus said unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. You see, Jesus just reasserted what has been told. We need constant strengthening from the Lord. Thank God he is risen to give us just that. What, that which we desperately need to fulfill God's will. I want to clarify something from John's gospel when you make this parallel studies. So let's go to John 20 now. Now please look at verse 10. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Remember uh, John and Peter went into the sepulcher and after the whole incident they believed that somebody has taken away Jesus' body and they moved away. And then we see in verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 11, Mary didn't go away, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. Everybody, and went, all of the ladies went away joyfully, right? Except her. Because she ran away. She was not part of the entire team of ladies who went inside and saw that Jesus is risen. She didn't hear everything that angel said. She was not there when Jesus appeared to the other women who were going. So she stood there after Peter and John left and kept crying. As she wept, verse 11, she stooped down 
and looked into the sepulchre. She was crying, she peeped in. Mercy of God, visiting this poor woman. Mary, as she looked in, seeth two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Not one, two. You know, in the book of Exodus, we see how God commanded Moses to make the Ark of the Covenant. And the top part of the Ark of the Covenant was called the mercy seat, which had on both sides two cherubims, two angels. Christ is the mercy seat of God. The judgment of God was upon him. And so he died for us. And the two angels, just like the picture of the mercy seat, with the two angels on both sides. Here Christ has the two angels. I'm just making a parallel observation. That's all, nothing more than that. But the great fact that Jesus is the just sacrifice for our sin required by the law, proven by the existence of the two angels in his tomb where he was laid. And then these two angels open their mouth and talk to the woman. Who is that? Mary Magdalene. Woman, why weepest thou? She said, because they have taken away my Lord. She said the same false news that she told the two apostles to the two angels. So she didn't really hear what the first angel said to the rest of the women. They have taken away my Lord and I know not where they have laid him. Verse 14. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back. And so Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Because she hasn't believed that, that Jesus is risen. She's thinking that he's still dead and somebody has taken the body away and hiding. So she didn't even imagine the possibility of Jesus standing next to her. So you see what unbelief can do? When you don't believe exactly what God says, even when the goodness of God comes to you, you don't see it. Because your faith is zero at that point. I have se seen people even in this church who, who had told the truth and I see how God is ready to bless them. I said, look at this, look at that. They, after that, they listened to me. Thank you, Pastor. Then they say, Pastor, I prayed about it. I decided against it. You know, this is one thing that irritating me all the time. They keep saying, praying. And what, what is that prayer? Prayer doesn't sanctify a thing unless it is according to God's truth. The Gentiles also pray. Not every prayer is pleasing to God. We are made to be very careful. Can you imagine this lady who loved the Lord Jesus so much, can't recognize him? What happened to you, Mary? There's only one answer. She is not focusing on his words of the resurrection. So she's blinded by her own judgment. Her own smartness is the prevention of the reality of the truth. Moving on quickly, come. And here we read. Woman, verse 15. Why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him. I will take him away. She still wanted to carry away the resurrected Christ. 
Isn't, this is why I said a while ago, if you really examine everything you say to God, you will laugh your head off of your stupidity concerning your prayers. She said, sir, where is my Jesus? Can you give it to me? Now, this guy is falsely, if he's a real gardener, she has just falsely accused him. Correct or not? You see where faith takes you? In the name of Jesus? But of course it's Jesus. And so the Lord responded. Verse 16. Mary. That's all Jesus said. Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabuni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not at ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and to your God. And then Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. I wonder when I was reading whether this question came. Some of the brethren here already asked me this question last Sunday. So I said, wait until I teach you today. And so they asked me this question. Maybe some of you had the same question. When Jesus appeared to the other ladies, Jesus said, uh, Jesus, uh, we are told that they held his feet and worship. But here we see Jesus to telling Mary Magdalene, touch me not, right? Verse 17, for I am not yet ascended to my father. So how come Jesus has two standards? To Mary Magdalene, he said, don't touch me because I have not ascended to my father. But to other ladies who held his feet, he said nothing. Now, the, I think the best way I can explain this to you is by pointing you to the meaning of the word touch. The word, the word touch even though it is, can be translated correctly as touch. That word also has the idea of clinging on to him. Clinging on to him. Because she is so moved emotionally. And she wanted to throw herself upon Christ and hold on to him. And Jesus said, no. What we saw on the, uh, in the other account in Matthew 28 is that the women fell at his feet. It is not to say... Uh, uh, they didn't touch him, but they did. But touching is, touching is not the issue. It's the response of the Mary Magdalene by wanting to cling on to him. And that was not allowed. Christ said it clearly. Worship, okay, but you can't. Hug me and cling on to me. So that's a simple explanation I can give you for that. Now coming back and concluding our Passage in Matthew 28, verse 11 onwards. And when they were going, behold, some of, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money to the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this... And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So as the women encouraged by Jesus to go and tell the disciples were on their way, something else happened. The guards, the Roman guards, were part of the watch party that the pilot, Roman governor appointed quickly ran from the place and told, according to verse 11, the chief priest, all the things that were done. What, what, what did they say? They said to the chief priest, look, there was an earthquake. There was an angel and his body is no more there. But the linen are, <coughs> are all well folded and left in the, in the tomb. He seemed to be risen. Oh, the chief priest said, <laughs> Oh, we cannot accept this kind of resurrection story. 
why don't we give you a good idea? First, let's make a deal. We always care for you, you know. We give you some good money. This cannot be possible. Maybe you are hallucinating or whatever. We give you some money and we teach you a clever thing. Just acknowledge that you fell asleep. Actually, they are not supposed to fall asleep. They are set on watch. It's a very dangerous thing to admit that they fell asleep while they are on guard. Right, boys who are in national service? If you're on guard duty, you fall asleep, what do you get? Well, you may be court-martialed. Well, that's a very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> so these guys were given money. You see, money is given to change the doctrine. Change the doctrine and the truth. And they went around and told the Jews, oh, this is what happened. The disciples, you know, the, the, the most ridiculous aspect of the story, if they were sleeping, how would they know disciples are the ones who stole? And that they are willing because they are blinded by money. You know what, brethren? Money can make anyone a fool. Many people have made themselves fool because of love of money. Better materialistic life. Better life. Unfortunately, these are the people who are going to stand against the truth and the preachers of the truth. They're going to make stories because they want to gain money. And uh, may I tell you, this one thing I always expected to happen. And it might happen sooner or later. Materialism, carnality are the greatest fight of Bible Presbyterianism, including Gethsemane. Materialism and carnalism. We have the doctrines, but these things will blind us. We will betray the truth that we say we believe. Westminster Confession of Faith is the right doctrine. The infallibility of the scripture, the inspired scripture, and its infallibility is the right thing to believe. Preservation of the scripture, VPP, is the right thing to believe. But love of money, the love of pleasure, will make us betray the truth. It already happens that those who have eye see it, let those who have a heart instructed by God discern it and keep themselves away from such sin. There is no guarantee Gethsemane BP Church will stand for the truth of the risen Christ. Why, I say, there is materialism. God's truth is not important. Money and pleasure must come first. If it works, then truth is acceptable. If not, never mind. This is eating us like a cancer. And the, that tumor is growing bigger by day. As the church grows, this sickness is going to get bigger. And nobody can stop it. Time is coming. When I will be a pastor who had to fight against my own congregation. It already began. You don't know. I tell you the truth. You may sit here for three hours and still it proves nothing about your faith if you are materialistic and carnal. After all the preaching, you still, after the money will shut your mouth against the truth. You will not prove the veracity and the validity of the word of God with your life. You will make God's word a mocking thing by the way you live. Because money and wealth and pleasure. That is the real struggle. May God deliver us from all forms of hypocrisy like that of the chief priest who made the fool even a greater fool 
by offering money. May this never be the reason why this church exists. Not to stir on the people who come here to live more and more materialistically. My prayer, every preacher and every elder and every father and mother in this congregation will have the audacity that comes by faith in Jesus Christ to tell those who are under their supervision that it is a sin to pursue anything that is contrary to the scripture. Going to the church is not what? Perfect our faith by yielding to the truth. May God deliver us from this evil. And even some of us, like me, who has imperfect faith, may we cry, Lord, open our eyes by your grace, that day by day I may grow in the knowledge and the purity of the words of my Savior and live in the power of his resurrection. May God help us. Let's all arise and sing our final hymn.